Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, which is India's first Future Tech Meets Sustainability podcast. And today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Mr. Brian Kennedy, who is known for his research in the biology of aging and is a visionary committed to translating research discoveries into new ways of detecting delaying, preventing, and treating human aging and associated diseases. He was the ex-president and CEO of Buck Institute. Uh, currently, he's the scientific advisor at Rejuvent and the director at the Center for Healthy Aging at the National University Health Systems and professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Physiology, Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine at the National University of Singapore. So, Ryan, really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. Well, my pleasure. I'm looking uh-huh. forward to it. So, so why don't we start with the Buck Institute? It's the first of its kind independent institute for research on aging. And it has some really, you know, the top of its kind rock star team of scientists and researcher that's taking a multi-pronged approach in the research of human longevity. As an ex-CEO, what was your major con- con- contribution to the Buck Institute? And how is Eric Worden and the team uh, taking the vision of the mantle forward? Yeah, I think that, you know, when I was there, it was a difficult time in the aging research field. And so um, there wasn't a lot of funding from National Institute of Aging, and which is a branch of the NIH. Uh, and the philanthropic and investment dollars hadn't uh, really come into the field yet. And so I think that, um, you know, we had to deal with a lot of financial issues and restructure a lot of things and hire some new people, new faculty to come in and address new areas of, of longevity research. And um, we also made it very entrepreneurial when I was there. We started seven new companies, um, some many of which are still going. Uh, and we set up a PhD program jointly with uh, University of Southern California so that we could have more PhD students and train the next wave of uh, longevity researchers. So we got a lot done. Uh, I wanted to go somewhere where there was a clinical component, and that's why I came to NUS. But, you know, Eric has done a good job of carrying the mantle. Uh, and uh, now that the financial resources are there through philanthropy and, and private sector, they're they're doing great things. So I'm looking forward to see how the research progresses at the butt. So you said, you know, when you were there at the Buck Institute, you know, you were you were the driving force be, behind, you know, starting a few companies, including Regiment. I mean, we, we'll talk about that. But what about the other companies? Where do they stand at this point in time? And what are they doing, you know, in the field of human yeah. longevity? There were a couple of companies around trying to develop programs to help people with cognitive impairment, and they're still going. Um, there was two program, two companies developed to uh study derivatives of rapamycin. So you may know rapamycin is one of the most promising drugs to extend lifespan and health span, uh, but it has side effects. And so we came up with a strategy to um, modify the drug so that it had many of the benefits without the side effects. Uh, one of those companies is Torcept and the other is Aovian. They're both still uh, in the development phase for new drugs. Uh, and um then also, uh, we started a company with, uh, it was Judy Campisi's work from the Buck and some people from Mayo Clinic uh, called, that ultimately became called Unity, uh, which went public and uh, is still actively doing research to try to find senolytic drugs, so drugs that kill or inhibit senescent cells. You, you, you mentioned about uh, rapamycin. Uh, there are others also working on repurposing, you know, the, these drugs. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about that? What are the other drugs which are available, which uh, is working in the field of human longevity? Yeah, so the two companies we started were like making new drugs around the related to rapamycin. But as you point out, there's another approach, which is to repurpose drugs that already exist for other reasons and are clinically approved for other reasons. One of them is rapamycin, which is for immune suppression, but also you have metformin, uh, which is an anti-diabetic drug uh, that is part of this team trial, uh, which is to try to prevent multiple different kinds of chronic diseases simultaneously, and that's being led by near Barzillai. Um, and there are a number of other drugs that are being developed for aging. Essentially, I think a lot of these drugs that target risk factors for disease, like metformin targets hyperglycemia, which is a risk factor for diabetes. 
Um, also, risk factors for hy- for cardiovascular disease that treat hypertriglyceridemia or high cholesterol. These drugs are candidate longevity molecules. They're targeting very early stages of disease processes that probably relate to, to the how people age. So uh, it's an interesting opportunity because these drugs have already been through a phase one, phase two, phase three. The safety data is already in existence. We know a lot about them. And if we can use them to actually slow or reverse aspects of aging, that may be one of the quickest ways to get drugs on the market. Uh, you, you mentioned in the course of conversation, you know, about Judith Campesi. She's a pioneer in the space of cellular senescence. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? And how yeah, I mean, she's been doing research in cell senescence for a long time now. Um, really cutting edge research. Uh, a lot of her initial work was really characterizing why senescence happens, uh, when it happens in the body, how it relates to cancer. It's a protective mechanism to keep cells from becoming cancerous. But then her later research, she found out that these senescent cells also secrete a bunch of factors called infl- their, it's called the senescence associated secretory profile. These are senescent factors, uh, or inflammatory factors, excuse me. Um, that may promote cancer progression in cells around them. So there may be a cell autonomous inhibition of cancer, but a, a paracrine effect driving cancer in other cells. So uh, there's a complex relationship between senescence and cancer. And she's also been very interested in how much senescent cells contribute to the aging process. And so um, based on her research and, and work by uh, uh, Jim Kirkland and uh, Jan van Dersen at Mayo, they came up with strategies to find drugs that would get rid of these senescent cells. Uh, and that's certainly one of the interesting pathways to look at in the longevity medicine space right now. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, there, are, there are a lot of people who are pushing the senescence pathway. So you, you, be, be, you are the scientific advisor at Rejuvent and Rejuvent uh, has these life tabs, uh, calcium, AKG, dietary mm-hmm. supplements, which promises to lower the biological age by eight years. Uh, okay, can you talk about that? Uh, is it being clinically proven? Is it effective? What's uh-huh. the science behind it? The sales of the supplements so far? And uh, are there any studies being conducted, uh, you know, post customers taking the supplements? Yeah, let me clarify a bit. Um, We found in the first study we did, and this was individuals taking the product for seven months, that they had a seven to eight year reversal in biologic age using a a DNA methylation uh, test as a a biomarker of aging. Um, So I don't know that we're promising that. That was the observation we found in in that one clinical study. Uh, We've done another clinical study since then and it, it, this one is a placebo-controlled, uh, more standard study. The first one was with just reusers of the product. Um, and this one we found, again, that people that are, um, we haven't published this data yet, so I can't go into too much detail, but essentially people that are at biologically ages aligned with their chronologic age. So in other words, they're aging normally or if their biologic age is older than their chronologic age, in other words, they're not aging particularly well, they again have a big response to uh, the product. So I think that um, AKG is certainly one of the interesting compounds to look at for longevity. And the nice thing about it is it's generally regarded as safe. It's a natural product uh, and it's been tested in many different ways and there's never been any safety issues with it. So uh, it's on the market through Ponce de Leon Health. And uh, I think that if people want to be early adopters, and try supplements that may affect the aging process. Uh, this is certainly one of the options out there. Talking about supplements, I mean, you know, b- besides this, the Rejuvent uh, Lifetime supplement, uh, if if there are people who are looking at, you know, leveraging these uh, supplements on the market, w- what are the other supplements that you would kind of advise or uh, point uh, the audience towards? Yeah, well, first of all, you know, the anti-aging space in the supplement industry is huge and it's been there for a long time. I think what the longevity research field has done is we brought in some science behind it and we're actually trying to validate what things are working and what things aren't working and why they might be working. So you can go get a lot of things in, in the GNC store that are say that they're anti-aging and some of them may work. It's just that there's not a lot of 
science to validate that. So what we're trying to do is put that real science behind it. Um, one of the other major classes of molecules are NAD boosters. Um, so this NAD is another molecule in your body. It's kind of in a sense like AKG. It's a central metabolite. It participates in many, many chemical reactions in your cells and it goes down with aging. Uh, and uh, supplementing it back up appears to provide health benefits. Uh, but you can't add NAD directly. You have to use a precursor or a booster such as NMN or NR, which are both available on the market, although NMN is, um, may or may not be classified as a natural product going forward. There's FDA's had some rulings on that. Uh, so I think that this is another area to look into that there's a lot of research uh, now, this aging field, obviously, I mean, you know, there are some of the top scientists, researchers in the world who are working on this field. Uh, and everybody's got their own approach. You uh, have your uh, specific approach and bias towards AKG or other, uh, uh, you know, interventions. What is it that you are, uh, you know, vouching for, which is going to be the right intervention for human longevity, possibly in the next, uh, you know, the, the coming future? Well, honestly, you know, what we've tried to do in, in U.S. is to set up an agnostic approach. Uh, so I'm working with another great scientist, Andrea Meyer, uh, and we're, we have a full pipeline of research now that goes all the way from basic science through preclinical science, uh, clinical studies, and ultimately into community uh, studies. Um, and the idea is not to test just one thing. I, I, of course, I like AKG, but I, I don't know if it's the best thing for humans, and um, nobody knows what the best thing for humans is yet, but the vast majority of the data is from animal models. So we're now validating things in animal models in our hands and then moving them into human clinical studies. And we want to test five to 10 different kinds of molecules against biomarkers of aging and really begin to understand which interventions work best in which people. Uh, I think that until we take it, somebody takes an agnostic approach like that, we're not going to really know what's going to work best. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I like AKG, of course, but you can make a case for NAD precursors or, I mean, I also like rapamycin a lot, uh, you know, and, and there are many other candidates. There are probably 40 legitimate things we could test now in humans that have good safety profiles. Uh, so let's start doing it and it, it let the let the molecules compete against each other. <laughs> so. Yeah, can, can you talk to us about your current uh, research works update? Sure. So uh, on the clinical studies, you know, one of the things we're doing is how do how do we do a clinical study to to, to test aging? Uh, and um, so we're trying to define those parameters, Andre and I and our colleagues. Um, you know, you could do a tame like study, which is uh, the metformin study in the U.S., but this is 3,000 people taking the drug for three years and 14 centers, and it costs $70 million. Um, and the idea there is to prevent multiple chronic diseases simultaneously in a population of 65-year-olds or something like that. Um, I think that's a great study. I'm supportive of it, but it costs a fortune, takes a long time. So what we're trying to do is use these new biomarkers of aging as endpoints. And so that's like epigenetic clock. Uh, there are many different clocks out there now. None of them are completely validated, but in our hands, they look like good measures of how fast a person's aging. So we're using those and then testing whether interventions slow or reverse those clocks, like I mentioned with AKG. And I think that allows us to do studies at a much lower cost, and then we can do a lot more studies. So we're really trying to define the parameters on how to do uh, longevity studies on the clinical side. On the preclinical side, re really it's about finding new interventions. And there's two things that we're becoming focused on. One is how do we combine interventions together in mice to have synergistic effects? And you might think that's trivial, but it turns out it isn't. I can't predict what's going to happen when we mix two things together. Sometimes they cancel each other out. And so you have a lot of people that are taking 10 or 15 different things. I have no idea what they're doing. So now we're going back into mouse studies and we're trying to figure out if we can get, first of all, understand the mechanisms by which these interventions work and then which ones combine together to have bigger effects. I think that's going to be important. How does the, the these clinical trials in, in these mouse uh, translate to humans? Well, um, 
you know, there's been a lot of arguments in the pharmaceutical field that mice are not such a good model for human disease. And that may be true, because when you think about it, mice generally don't get I diseases identical to humans. So if you want to study a human disease like Alzheimer's, you have to engineer that disease in a mouse. So you're looking in a non, uh, kind of an artificial situation. And then on top of that, you do it in a young mouse when it's old people that get Alzheimer's. And so I think that we, I, I'm trying to help redesign mouse experiments so that they're a, they're more human-like. So we want to use age-appropriate mice. So if the human gets the disease at 80 years, we need to study the mouse at 24 months or 22 months, not at three months, you know, things like that. And also we don't make artificial diseases. We're looking at the natural aging process in mice. And we think that even though the what happens in the brain is a little bit different, you get degeneration in both contexts and the same thing in the liver and the muscle. And so we think by looking at the natural processes that are driving this uh, and slowing that down, looking for interventions that slow or reverse aging, it's more likely that'll correspond to the natural processes in humans. And finally, we're not doing survival studies in the mice anymore. So um, traditionally, the way to look at aging was to see how long the animals live. There's nothing wrong with that, except it takes a long time and we're not doing the human studies like that. So. We can't give a 50-year-old a drug and see if they live longer or not. I don't have any graduate students that want to do the PhDs that last 40 years. So um, we're doing the human studies at six to nine-month interventions with biomarkers. And so now we're doing that in the mice. We start with middle-aged mice and do six-month interventions and look at biomarkers and frailty rather than survival. So I think it's about how do we align the mouse studies in a way that they'll be a better model for human aging. Uh, the, the, so th th there are a lot of these teams who are kind of studying nature, you know, animals specifically, you know, because there, yeah. there are things which is happening in the nature, especially specifically with a few animals like the jellyfish, bowhead whale and others. Yeah. Uh, they, they're trying to mimic that. Uh, what, what are your views on that? Is, is that possibly one of the approaches? I mean, maybe talk about yeah. that. And what are the other approaches besides this, like mimicking the nature? Are there other approaches which has caught your attention, which could be like the yeah. approach for, to... for so there are two kinds of sort of ways you use animal models. One is that you use things like mice because they're models for humans. So, uh, and that's what we just discussed already. Or even simpler systems like worms and flies and yeast, they age very rapidly. So you can do experiments very quickly. And at least some of the pathways you find are conserved in humans. Uh, but there's another approach you can take too, which is to find animals that have exceptional longevity. So these are animals that live a very, very long time. Naked mole rats are a classic example of this. Um, whales, uh, there are clams. There's all kinds of species that have very low rates of aging or even negligible aging. And so then you can ask the question, what is it about that animal that makes it live such a long time? Um, now, in the past, that's been limited because you can find things that are different in those animals, but those are correlations. You can't infer from that, that that difference is what's causing that animal to live a long time. So what's happening now that I think is cool, and uh, an example of this is Vera Gorbanova's lab in Rochester in New York, is that they found a difference in naked mole rats in terms of how they produce this molecule called hyaluronic acid. They have a very a longer version of hyaluronic acid, and that provides benefits. And so then they engineered a mouse that makes longer hyaluronic acid, and sure enough, the mouse lives longer. So that proves there's some causal effect to that molecule. So yeah, I think there's a lot to be learned from studying these exceptionally, exceptionally long-lived animals. It turns out that they may all have figured out different mechanisms to live a long time. So we may learn something different from each one of them. But the key thing is finding out whether it's applicable to humans or not. Right. And this this whole thing is so complex, which you pointed out in the beginning of the conversation. And it's it's a complex problem, you know, solving uh, for a aging. Uh, what do you think is, is the role of artificial intelligence over there? You know, because there's a lot of, uh, you know, fields which are leveraging AI. Uh, how do you see that uh, playing out over here? Well, for one thing, it's critical because you can't publish a paper without using artificial intelligence somewhere in it these days. <laughs> so, I'm joking. Uh, I, I think um, 
look, this is critical because it, the field has completely changed. You know, I think that in a way it's disappointing <laughs> uh, because, you know, when we worked in the old days on yeast aging and simple systems, we would have a, a, a only a limited ways to interrogate a very small amount of data. And so we'd have a puzzle and then we'd come up with an elegant idea for how to solve the puzzle, develop a hypothesis and test it, and we'd be right or wrong. And if we were right, we felt like, wow, our, we, you know, our brains really discovered something. And now science has changed. You know, a lot of it, is, there's still hypothesis-driven science, don't get me wrong, but a lot of it is taking huge data sets with lots of omics, you know, transcriptomics or DNA methylation patterns or whatever, and then feeding that into a computer and letting it use machine learning or cognitive neural networking to determine, you know, patterns and identify pathways that are that, that may drive aging or measure your aging rate. And it, it turns out, I think it's very effective. We're doing a lot of this in our lab now, and there, it's kind of fun in a way, but the frustrating thing is it spits out an answer and then you're like, well, why is that the answer? It's it's almost like the Douglas Adams book where the answer to the whole world is 42. You know, it's like, well, what does that mean? You know, and, and I feel like we're kind of getting there in some ways. But the truth is that the AI approach has really moved the field forward, both in terms of diagnostics and in terms of um, trying to find new interventions. So um, it's an exciting component to the field. Right. Uh, though, I mean, at this point in time, AI is completely a black box. You really yeah. don't understand what it's doing at the back end, but it's doing something which, which is extremely magical by passing out that humongous amount of data and, you know, creating something which can be, uh, you know, useful in the long run. So, so there are these exciting convergence of technologies and research uh, is creating something really, really, I mean, cool. Uh, what is that, you know, which has caught your attention in the field of human longevity? You know, the peer, the peers who are, uh, you know, doing work. Anything that specific which has caught your attention? Yeah, you know, I think it's the the rejuvenation area is really interesting. The so all almost all of all of your tissues have stem cells in them that at different rates uh, re replenish your tissues, and when you're young. Most tissue is very active and you're turning over your tissue, getting rid of damaged cells, making new cells. And that that's an important part of keeping you functional and disease free. And during, as you get older, those stem cells become less functional and you uh, have a harder time replacing your tissues. Uh, and I think that, you know, if you can reprogram cells back to stem cells, uh, then you can sort of restore that differentiation potential and that, pop, that proliferation potential in your tissues and rejuvenate them as you get older. And so the, taking advantage of the knowledge of iPS technology where you can reprogram cells in a dish back to stem cells, now there's strategies to try to do that in vivo to take the somatic cells in your body and reprogram some of them back to stem cells. The early data in animals is promising, uh, there's a lot of issues with this. You you don't want to make cancer cells, <laughs> which uh, you might do if you create cells that are truly ES cells. So you want to partially reprogram them. Uh, I think this is there's a lot to be done there, and it's probably not ready for prime time in terms of humans. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it's one of the things that could potentially have a very large effect on longevity in the future. Right. I, I think Altos by Bi Bioscience uh, and a couple of others are yeah. taking the uh, uh, approach. Uh, 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 is there any regimen that you follow and is there any advice that you would give to our listeners who would want to kind of explore the opportunity? Well, of I, yeah, I take the Rejuvenate product, which is the AKG product, and I do it because it's safe. And, uh, you know, I think the data is promising. I, I think you can... There's two things I would say. First is lifestyle is important. <laughs> you know, you may not want to hear this, but if you can do sustainable exercise, and that would be some cardiovascular exercise, a little bit of resistance training. If you can have a healthy diet, um, and we can talk about what that is if you want. If you can manage your stress levels, if you can get work on your sleep quality, which is sometimes harder to modify than the other three, you're going to have be healthy longer. On average, you might be healthy 10 years longer just by doing those things effectively. They're not easy to do. 
but but they work. Uh, and then when you're looking at the supplements and other things out there, it really depends on your um, desire to be at the cutting edge, do, trying things that are not fully validated yet, or whether you want to wait five or 10 years until we have more data. I think that there are safe things like the AKG product that you can try if you're interested. Um, there also, you can get your aging measured now. There are many companies that you can send your blood or saliva into and they'll es estimate your biologic age. Um, there are also longevity clinics around the world where you can you know, spend a lot of money getting everything in your body measured and, uh, and then come up with a personal plan to make you be as healthy as long as possible. Um, I think a lot of those places are doing really cool stuff. Again, a lot of it's not fully validated yet. So I really believe if people are educated, they're told the benefits and the, any potential risk, and they feel like they want to move ahead with this, they should be allowed to do that. But we need to make sure that whatever we're doing for people right now, we're transparent about the knowledge we have and the knowledge we don't have. I think what gets me nervous in the field is when somebody says, if you do this, you're definitely going to live longer because we really don't have, beyond exercise, maybe we don't have, <laughs> we don't have enough data to say that with all, any of the pills yet, I believe. So. Right. Yeah, yeah. So yes, I mean, you know, the traditional path to follow is, you know, healthy diet, stress-free life, exercise, mindfulness, and with it, possibly the supplements, you know, which which will uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, could help. Though this this is a promising field, I, I guess, uh, uh, you know, I believe aging is, is the biggest problem that we're fa facing currently, you know, and if we solve this problem, I think humanity will be much better off. Though the problem is of the population, you know, because we, we just recently you know crossed 8 billion how does that work do we get onto the metaverse i mean it, it, it's it's a little uh, but yeah yeah but what what you what, want me what, to solve what, all the world's problems <laughs> <laughs> like uh, what, what would be your your timelines i mean you know if we yeah. had to say that you know if you had to put a, a, a number to the timeline when do you think you know we would have hum, human longevity accessible for everyone well if, if, there's a lot of questions there first of all let me say we did go over 8 billion mm -hmm. but the rate of uh, repopulation is going down rapidly. You know, in Singapore, we're only making 1.1 offspring for every couple. Where you know, so that's not even half of what, or about half of what's needed to repopulate the keep the population normal. And even in India, the reproductive rates are going down dramatically. So, uh, I you know, that's what drives population is reproduction uh, and uh, how many kids you have per couple, and that's going down everywhere. So it's unclear what the long-term effects on population are going to be. Um, let's say we completely stopped aging by some magic thing, you know, and uh, all of a sudden nobody was aging. Uh, people would still die and they would get in accidents and things like that, but at a very low rate. And a lot of people would live a very long time. But this isn't going to happen tomorrow, you know. Even if we stopped aging 10 years from now, there's still no 200-year-old people around. It takes people have to age. And so the, the the changes to society, I think, are going to be more gradual than people understand. And I don't think we're going to have a magic pill that completely stops aging tomorrow anyway. So um, I think there'll be a lot of changes if people are living to, everybody's living to 100, or some people are living to 150. Um, but they'll happen gradually. And I think mostly they'll be good. Um, I think what you can expect in the shorter term future, though, is that a lot of the interventions we're testing now, I think they're going to have modest effects. And look, if we can extend health span by five years, that's a huge victory. <laughs> that would save trillions of dollars in health care costs. You know? And so that's already probably bigger than curing any one disease of aging. Uh, and so we shouldn't diminish the value of that. You know what the possibility is in the future. I, I think is I think it's probably very large. I think there ultimately we may find strategies that have massive effects on longevity, uh, but it's still unpredictable. We don't know that for sure yet. But I think if people can look forward to having things that are on the market that have modest effects uh, in in the very near future. And you also mentioned equity, which is a big issue. Uh, you know, as drugs get developed. They often are available to the rich and then the, the insured and, you know, like with HIV drugs, it took 35 years to get them into Africa at a very uh, uh, equitable, equitable, 
equitable way. Sorry, I'm losing my mind. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, there's some inevitability to that, but I'm certainly committed to finding strategies that help everybody. I tell people it's not about the billionaires, it's about the billions. And there's 2 billion of those people over 65 in 2050. So we need to do something about for that helps everybody. Uh, thank you, Brian. It was really a pleasure and honor to be speaking to you. And, and yeah, I think a profound note to end on that, you know, it's, it, it, it you know, it's not it's for everyone the technology should be for everyone once yes. we have it you know to make it equitable and accessible for everyone because there's always been the world has always been hierarchical and i think it's always just maybe around four percent of the population that owns the 90 or 95 percent of the entire wealth and they are the ones who are the privileged few who get access to technology education healthcare, and the rest of the population kind of completely misses out on, yeah. on the great things you know which they could you know and i think the world can be a, a great place place and I, and I think you know people such as yourself and and the the current breed of entrepreneurs are asking brave questions and they they they're looking at upending everything and reinventing things because I think you know so far every businesses structures organization education healthcare has been in, in a very legacy uh in a box uh, you know and everything had had to be in a box but i think you know we are going beyond we are asking deeper questions and this man machine partnership that we have kind of like you know uh, taken you know the journey like though artificial intelligence is still a block, uh, black box but the kind of leverage that we are having with ai with virtual reality with metaverse with iot web3 blockchain it, it, it's 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 it, it's unfathomable and i think you know the next few years because it, it, just with web3 and block uh, blockchain and uh, metaverse the ethos over there for entrepreneurship is completely changing you know we're moving from a hierarchical manner uh, to saying things like you know things should be decentralized and it should be interoperable it should be open and and I think science is also getting into the field. I mean, who would have thought that you know? I mean, uh, a company like DeepMind would go ahead and solve the protein folding for, uh, uh, for yeah. problem, you know, leveraging AI. So so there's these interesting things and dynamics happening, you know, because of technology and and these man machine partnership. I, I think we need to keep on doing that and pushing the boundary. Uh, if you had to paint a picture of what the future might look like, you know, because we're talking about precision healthcare, we be talking about AI being used for drug discovery and so on and so forth uh, uh what what uh 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 well i i think that you know this may be a little specific to my field but i think that we need to stop relying on sick care the real revolution of longevity research is it's health care it's keeping you healthy and functional rather than waiting till you get sick and keeping you sick, which too much of medicine is doing right now. And don't get me wrong, when I get sick, I wanna be treated. I'm not saying we do away with that strategy, but that's all we're doing right now. And really, if we wanna be healthy and we wanna maximize our potential, we need a life course approach to health. You know, we need to be taking people, youngsters in school and not only teaching them science and medicine, but teaching them how to have a healthy lifestyle, to understand their body and how to keep it working. Uh, we need to think about interventions in people in the 30s and 40s. They're not sick yet. They don't have a disease indication. But if we target aging, which is the biggest risk factor for every problem, we can not only prevent those diseases, but we can improve their performance now, you know, in their 30s and 40s, they'll have more energy, they'll think better, they'll function better. And then when they get sick, they need to be treated. And, and right now, you know, so I, that's three broad approaches and all, all we're doing is one of them. And we're doing the one that it costs the most and is the least effective. So I, I think that, you know, what this is a revolution, you know, it's a healthcare revolution, you know, we need to, take back the mantle from sick care and say, let's do a full life course approach to health. Really, really appreciate uh, uh, the privilege uh, speaking to you. Wish you the very best and, and whatever you're building. I hope that what you do, I mean, touches the life of everyone and it's accessible for uh, everyone. So thank you for being part of the podcast. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. And until next time, see you guys. Thanks thank a lot. You. Really appreciate this.